This is the uh, commissioner's panel, um, and uh, you've already met uh, uh, Commissioner Granis from uh, New York. Uh, Bob Martin, the New Jersey commissioner, uh, was planning on being here, but he was summoned to a cabinet meeting by Governor Christie, and somehow that trumped us. Um, but we are very pleased that uh, we have in his place Raymond Cantor, who is special assistant to the uh, commissioner of the New Jersey uh, DEP. Um, uh, he also serves, uh, in addition to being chief counselor to the commissioner, he manages the Office of Legal Affairs and oversees the Office of Economic uh, Analysis uh, within uh, New Jersey DEP. And we also have Pedro Nieves, who is the chair of the Puerto Rico Environmental Quality Board. Uh, he has served uh, also EPA as a scientist and an attorney. Um, Robert Mathis of uh, the Virgin Islands had planned to be here, but he had a conflict as well. So why don't we start with uh, Raymond Cantor from New Jersey. Thank you. I assume this is working well. Um, Bob Martin uh, wants to apologize. He cannot be here. Yes, uh, he is with the cabinet today. They're actually doing a, I guess, a desktop, desktop um, demonstration on hurricane re response. Part of that, by the way, may also be focusing on how New Jersey will handle if the Gulf oil spill comes up the East Coast. So hopefully that's just a desktop demonstration and, and never gets put into reality. Um, what, he, what the Commissioner wants me to talk about today and what's going on in New Jersey is the transformation of the Department of Environmental Protection. For those of you, I'm not sure who's from New Jersey or who pays attention to New Jersey politics, but we had an election back in November and we have a new governor and a new commissioner. And what is significant about that is really for the first time in New Jersey, we have a conservative Republican governor who is very pro-business and economic growth. We have a DEP commissioner who does not come really with an environmental background. He comes from Accenture as a business consultant, so he comes from, from, from the business world. So we have, you know, two leaders, you know, in New Jersey now with, with a business orientation. And the real question from an environmental perspective is, you know, what does that mean for New Jersey? Um, I think what it means for New Jersey is that we're going to have a real balance between economic growth and environmental protection, that we're going to be having policies that look at results and not just prescriptive regulations, that we're going to be really be basing our decisions on what the science says and not really on an uh, ideological basis. Now, again, I, I said, you know, that our governor is um, a conservative Republican. Again, for those of you who follow New Jersey politics, um, you, you know he says what he means and he means what he says. But um, he, he does not mean, um, as you would think for, for other Republicans, that we are a drill, baby drill type of state. He, he has come out firmly against ocean drilling in New Jersey and in, against uh, ocean drilling in the entire Northeast. He has come out against offshore drilling uh, or, excuse me, offshore, you know, a liquefied natural gas. He has taken a very strong stand against a tritium leak in Oyster Creek, its nuclear power plant down in Ocean County. That, that leak happened a couple of years ago. And, you know, um, the peace response, at least in our viewpoint, has not been nearly aggressive enough in protecting the public. He has come out strongly in favor of wind, offshore wind, you know, in New Jersey, but very aggressive for that and for solar, and against having any new coal plants in New Jersey. He has petitioned the EPA only recently to go after a coal-fired plant in Pennsylvania that we believe is fouling our air and also the air over Manhattan and, and New York as well. And he's, they've come out very strongly in favor of environmental justice. So, so this is a, a real opportunity, at least from our perspective, to show that conservative principles can result in strong environmental protection, strong environmental results, and also grow the economy. I, I think we're going to be successful in, in doing so. But really, to get to that point, we're looking at three fundamental changes in how the Department of Environmental Protection operates in New Jersey. There are organizational changes we have put in place. There's obviously policy changes that, that we have put in place. Um, you know, we have uh, vast differences of you know, our policy agenda for, from the last administration. And we believe we need to have a cultural change as to how the DEP, how a regulatory agency, how a state government you know, treats the people coming before it uh, for permits. I only have a, a short bit of time, so I'm just going to go through you know, several of these things and I can ask, answer uh, questions later on. 
Uh, one of the things we did from an organizational perspective is we changed, um, you know, how we operate. For a long time, for the last 20 years or so, DEP has been very much a process structured organization. We had our divisions of enforcement, we had uh, divisions of permitting, uh, separate policy, separate planning. We are now reorganized departments, so we are much more media based. We now have a new division of, of water. So we had a meeting with the commissioner um, a couple of months ago, and we have problems with Barnegat Bay and a number of other watersheds. And he asked, like he likes to ask, well, who owns the Barnegat Bay? You know, who's responsible for, for, for cleaning it up and making sure, you know, it, it is protected? And the answer at that point was, well, this person does this, this person does that, this person is responsible for, for something else. There was no one who owned that. So we decided we need to go back to a media-based organizational structure so there will be people who own you know, uh, the, the results uh, that, that will happen. We also then created, and this has been fairly controversial in, in the New Jersey world, a new assistant commissioner for economic growth and green energy. We do not believe that economic growth really is diametrically opposed to environment, environmental protection. Uh, I, I think you've heard before, I, I think with your New York City speaker on, on energy, you know, unless you have the money, you know, to, to do the improvements, unless you have the economic growth, you're not going to get some of the benefits that you want. If you want to change infrastructure, if you want to change, you know, energy sources, you really need economic growth. But you can have that balance, and you can grow in certain ways that are, you know, environmentally responsible. Uh, we are creating a department or an office of uh, alternative dispute resolution. Uh, we are now overwhelmed in New Jersey with contested cases of permit denials that are going through um, our Office of Administrative Law and then or through the courts. There are hundreds of backlog you know, cases. Some of them don't even get a hearing for over a year. We're hoping through um, changing in our policy uh, and creating an off uh, alternative dispute resolution process that we could move a lot more of these cases out, get resolutions uh, quicker than we had before. Um, part of that, by the way, is uh, we're also going to ish, um, change our regulations to allow us much more flexibility in how we regulate um, uh, the, uh, um, the development and, the, and um, other people in New Jersey. So we're going to be putting waivers in a number of our, of our uh, regulatory provisions. Often what happens in New Jersey, and again, and you'll find this you know, elsewhere, we have regulation upon regulation after upon regulation. Obviously, you know, I'm not necessarily knocking regulations, but sometimes they are crafted in such a way as to not provide the flexibility you need to make logical decisions. When I first came to the department a number of years ago, one of the first things I told my staff was, don't bring me any solution or, or, or any response that results in a worse environmental result because that's what the rules say. So we need the flexibility in our rules to allow for, you know, to have, uh, good economic results, good environmental results, and hopefully get to a better and improved ecological condition at the end of the day. Right, right now, we don't have that type of flexibility. We are now creating a science advisory board. Again, I mentioned that the commissioner and the governor really wants our decisions to be based on science. Often, you know, in the political world, and, you know, state government really is uh, um, the political world, as is all government, um, you will find decisions uh, happen based in the past based on the results that they wanted. They want to stop this project. They wanted to stop development in certain areas. Uh, we are trying to get away from that entirely. We're, we're trying to get away from political science and really get back to real science. So we've created a science advisory board um, filled with academics throughout the state, uh, filled with professionals who have been in industry and environmental groups as well. So when we have those really tough issues, you know, we're trying to take it out of the political world and really get those answers that will, that will guide us to get the results that we want, which is really clean air, clean water, um, healthy living for everyone in New Jersey. We've also created an Office of Ecological Restoration. Um, too often, uh, for those of you familiar with wetland laws you know, or, or a number of other requirements, you try to pigeonhole uh, mitigation in certain areas, and you're not really getting the, the biggest bang for the buck. You will find you'll spend two, three hundred thousand dollars to try to create an acre of wetlands, you know, in an urban environment. And maybe from an ecological perspective, maybe that money should be going somewhere else. Again, we have a number of policy uh, changes as well. The governor on his first day in office uh, issued an executive off, um, order um, requiring all state departments impose or adhere to common sense principles of regulation. 
uh, we're going to be looking at cost benefits of, of what we're doing. You know, why are we restricted in the federal government? Is there a real reason for doing that? Um, you know, can we delegate this down to the locals? Is this something that the state government should be doing? We want to get back to our core mission at the department of, of protecting what we have interest in from a New Jersey perspective and not try and regulate every single parcel throughout the state of New Jersey, which is what we've been doing for a while and has been bogging us down. Um, we have a licensed site remation, remation professionals program. New Jersey has a long history of contaminated sites. We have over 20,000 contaminated sites, and none of them are really being cleaned up because we've been bogged down in process, bogged down in regulation. We have now passed a law, um, happened in, um, in the last administration, obviously. We're now implementing it. But it, it licensed professionals who do site remediation so they could go out there and they could begin to clean up those sites without DEP's prescriptive oversight. Of course, we're going to be overseeing them to make sure that they act responsibly, but we're hopeful that we're going to start cleaning up you know, uh, those sites you know, in rapid fashion and return them to, to economic use. And again, we want flexibility in what we're doing. Um, again, part of what our mission is as well is a cultural change. Uh, the commission has been very clear he wants to treat people coming to us as customers. If you make a phone call to DEP, he expects us to return you know, uh, with, with a phone call back to them. He wants you know, to treat the regulated community, the public, you know, as our partners in trying to make New Jersey a better place and trying to grow the economy of New Jersey. It, again, it's an attitude mind, uh, mindset. Uh, again, I've been with the department for a number of years you know, in, in past administrations, and you really do find that there are um, good employees in New Jersey, very capable, but who do not necessarily see uh, the people coming before them for a permit as um, someone who's allowed to do something. A permit really is permission to do something. It's allowable activity. Often uh, people within the department may look at that person as trying to do something bad, trying to get over on, on, on us. Um, uh, again, um, people who come in for permits, you know, even though there is going to be uh, environmental harm, the law has said that there is a balance. We do need economic growth, and these things are permitted. Again, we're just changing how we, we act with them. We're also trying to be honest and, and fair and, and give you quick answers. If the answer is going to be no, we're going to try and give you a very quick no so you can move on to something else. You know, often in the past, you know, people have been afraid to make decisions, and you've been dragged along for one, two, three years. You know, maybe if you did this, maybe if you did that. Well, if the answer is going to be no, we're trying to tell you no up front, do something else. But conversely, if the answer is going to be yes, we're going to help you get that yes quicker. Because behind every permit is really jobs, is really economic growth. And again, if we do things in the right ways, if we develop in the right areas, we can have both economic growth and you know, environmental protection as well. We're also going to have a, a lot more um, information technology, hopefully in the next year or two, um, budget you know, uh, allowing. We will uh, um, have everyone you know, um, submitting their permits to us online. You'll be able to track your permits online. You'll be able to get all the information you need from us you know, online. So uh, again, you know, um, state government has been behind the information technology world for, for quite some time. It's really going to take that type of a, a strong investment, a priority, to make us much more efficient so we can do the things that we want to do. I've been just running through you know, all these types of things. Hopefully we'll have time for questions later on. But from our perspective, we see the change that we're transforming in the department as really a possible model for the rest of the nation. Um, again, I think for too long, um, environmental protection has been one of command and control, uh, of prescription, of treating the regulated community as the enemy. We think we have an opportunity to really set strong standards, to set you know, clear goals, to um, work with people to get the results that we really want, to measure our results through a metric system. So we believe this is an opportunity um, being led by a strong governor by a strong uh, c commissioner, so we get the environmental results we want and also grow the economy. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Now I'll ask Commissioner Granis to uh, resume the stand. Thanks very much, Mike. And, uh, I want to congratulate Columbia because while it's cool down here, I was standing up in the back during the last panel, 
and the uh, cutting off the air conditioner. It's obviously, a big move in sustainability, and I think your carbon, <laughs> carbon footprint is going to improve dramatically. Um, well, I'm tempted. I, I spent, as Mike mentioned, a long time in the state legislature, and well, I had a great deal of freedom then to say what I really thought. Um, I'm somewhat more constrained, so I won't comment on the revolutionary changes that are coming from New Jersey. Um, <laughs> And I'll focus on what we're doing here in New York. <laughs> Obviously, a lot has changed since I spoke here in uh, 2008. And it's obvious it makes a huge difference uh, who's in the White House, as we now know. And I think with the president and his choice of Lisa Jackson and his environmental team, it is a real breath of fresh air. And obviously, we're moving forward. I think some of the discussion this morning, in a relatively short amount of time, a huge number of changes are taking place uh, at federal EPA and the Council of Environmental Quality things that are important to us that we've worked on, that we've had to sue on in the past, um, that we are now finding really active partners, and it makes a huge difference for the work we do. And uh, just to remind everybody how smart Lisa Jackson was, he picked you to thank as his regional administrator for here, here in New York and for New Jersey and the Virgin Islands and Puerto Rico, one of the great uh, government regions of all time. Um, I always thought that would be the ideal job, those fact-finding trips, January, February, and March. <laughs> Connie Aristov is here. How much time did you spend? They never <laughs> well, I think it's a great region, and obviously there's a lot going on in New Jersey and, and New York, which I'm much more familiar with than I am in, the, in Puerto Rico and the Virgin Islands. And any, anybody that's worked with Judith, uh, as I did over many, many years in the legislature through her many other activities, she's a real force of nature. She's very passionate and committed, opinionated. <laughs> and a real environmental leader. And it's been a great honor for us to both work with her as the secretary, deputy secretary to the governor on environmental matters and then for her in her new position. But it's very, very important that we're able to work together with federal EPA because it's a real partnership. And if we're going to move ahead uh, on a whole host of issues, and I'll talk about one in particular, this partnership is critically important. And as important as the partnership is the ability for the states to keep moving on their own. Because we have ideas, we have innovation, we have ways of approaching things. Uh, we have some flexibility that the federal government doesn't have on many matters. We have our own difficulties, but the ability to move on our own is critically important. But right now, as many of you know, we're in a little bit of uh, difficulty in, in Albany, um, both with the legislature itself uh, not being able to come to uh, grips with the budget that's before them from the governor. There was a poll on the television station uh, last week that 54% uh, of the people that called into the TV station think that this year's budget will be passed by April next year. <laughs> so you talk about a level of cynicism about what's going on, and then coping with a $9.5 billion deficit is obviously a great uh, moment for the people of New York and the governor in particular who's been talking about this. But it's had a real effect on our agency. We've lost a lot of uh, resources. We've been, had to cut to $32 million of our non-personal service budget which is, uh, for people that don't really know what that is, those are the computer cartridges and the ink cartridges, the gas that our conservation officers use, the ability to calibrate our air pollution monitoring equipment, the, to get out in the water and inspect the clam beds and oyster beds out on Long Island. It's just a host of difficulties uh, that limit our ability to, uh, to do our job. But we have extraordinary men and women that work at the department. They have been through tough times before, not quite like this, unfortunately, but, uh, fortunately, but it's, a, it's a challenge. But I think they're up to the challenge. They've got an awful lot to do. And uh, our friends in Washington, nobody is saying do less. Uh, we're getting more and more calls for more activity from our partners in, in Washington at EPA. And uh, we're going to do those with the resources that we have. So we're obviously struggling. We have our hands full. We've got a host of issues uh, to maintain water quality and the gains we've made over the last 40 years, fighting back against the, against the scourge of invasive, invasive species, finding more efficient and better ways to deal with waste, protecting endangered species in our forest, and it goes on and on and on. It's a great big agency. We have a lot of responsibilities, and we're making progress every day. But I'd like to talk briefly about climate change. I was talking about that in my earlier talk when I was here on behalf of uh, the Deputy Secretary, Peter Arwanowitz. Uh, so if I step on my lines then or now, you have to apologize, because now I have a script. <laughs> um, over the past uh, decade, we've seen an abundance of climate initiatives across the country. We talked about some of these this morning. Over 30 states have renewable perform performance standards. More than 30 have put together climate action plans. 14 states have adopted California's motor vehicle standards. 
23 states are part of the three regional greenhouse gas initiatives that I talk about, led by our great Reggie experiment. Uh, these initiatives have really sprouted from impatience. The federal government was MIA for many years, as everybody here knows, so states filled in the void. But now it appears that we'll soon have some partners in Washington, and maybe the sleeping giant is awoken, and that's going to be to the benefit of us, those of us that care about the environment. And as a result of the Supreme Court's ca case uh, with the uh, providing an EPA with the authority to regulate greenhouse gases, which was talked about this morning. Um, EPA is taking important steps, and Congress itself is in the throes of, somebody said it's really in here, developing, I guess, thinking about climate legislation. Uh, there are drafts. The House has passed a bill. The Senate has the Kerry-Lieberman uh, bill. Um, obviously, there's a great deal going on, and that's good news, because as effective as state actions have been, Reaching the required national emission standard reductions demands a strong federal effort, and we all agree on that. But there's still more questions and answers in Washington at the moment. Will Congress be able to agree on legislation? You just have to watch the Ben Nelson uh, Cornhusker amendment to the health bill that, and the disaster that put out there, obviously cobbling together legislation that can potentially master or gather 60 votes is very difficult. So then the other question is, will, will EPA instead pick up the pace in regulating greenhouse gas emissions under the Clean Air Act? Either way, what role the states will play uh, in this new equation is a big issue. Should we just pack up and go home? i just give you my response is not a chance. We're going to heed the advice of the great New Yorker, Yogi Berra, who said, when you get to the fork in the road, take it. <laughs> We're going to continue to fight climate change regardless of what happens in Washington. I want to start with fork number one, the status quo, which is not uh, having any federal legislation. If 2010 ends without federal legislation, we'll move forward with REGI. As the nation's first greenhouse gas cap and trade program and the world's first to auction almost all of the allowances, REGI has put New York State at the leading edge of national and subnational efforts to use the market to combat climate change. Through REGI, we are showing the world what a successful carbon market looks like. Starting with the first ever auctions of carbon dioxide allowances in the United States in late 2008, we've had seven quarterly auctions, each with tremendous success. In total, more than 200 million allowances have been sold, generating more than $580 million for the 10 partnering states. $213 million of that has come to New York. And that is, uh, we are one of the few money-making operations <laughs> taking a, a, functioning right now in New York. But that's just the start. It's estimated that over the next three years, New York could see much more, as much as $450 million in REGI proceeds, which we're investing in energy efficiency and renewable energy through our partners at NYSERDA. You so heard about that a little bit in the last panel. And REGI, REGI instead of being a cap and trade program, is probably more rightly considered a cap and invest program because the investments we make will pay us back two to three times in reduced electricity bills, higher paying jobs, and a stronger local tax base. REGI has demonstrated to other states, to the federal government, and to the international community that carbon markets can be good for the environment, consumers, and the development of high-paying jobs. These state and regional programs are achieving real results. A recent study concluded that existing state and regional programs will reduce emissions by 7% across the United States by 2020. It's a very significant number without a national program. That means because the CO2 reductions that state and regional programs like REGI have already achieved, America is nearly halfway toward reaching the 17% nationwide reduction targets that President Obama committed to, even in the absence of a federal program. We are now focusing on using our programs as the building blocks of a national program. As I mentioned earlier this morning, toward that end, we are working with the other two regional pro uh, initiatives to coordinate our work. And we invite EPA to join us to build a national program for the foundations of these linked and coordinated programs. And we've been pleased to work with Gina McCarthy, the Assistant Administrator for AIR, a REGI partner, a former REGI partner, right from the start, and a brilliant, uh, I think, administrator, and another great choice uh, by Lisa Jackson this time, who picked a REGI partner herself to, uh, to join her at uh, EPA. Under the Clean Air Act, uh, EPA can and should be setting emission standards for new power plants. When it does, EPA is then required to issue guidance to states on regulating existing sources, sources not covered by the EPA standards. This guidance should build on the regional programs, requiring all states to join one of the existing programs or create their own. The Reggie states aren't standing pat waiting for the outcome of climate negotiations in Washington. 
we're expanding our approach, as I mentioned this morning. Uh, the governors of the Reggie states, along with Pennsylvania, have agreed to develop a low-carbon fuel standard to promote the use of low-carbon sustainable biofuels and electric vehicles. We are now partnering with our counterparts in other state transportation departments to develop additional greenhouse gas reduction strategies, including reducing the amount we drive, developing the infrastructure we need for a low carbon transportation sector. And as part of the three year Reggie review, we are evaluating how the Reggie cap and investment program should evolve. This review may reevaluate the level of the Reggie cap itself and may consider whether other sectors or sources should be added. Everything is on the table. Now, just Briefly, let me get to fork number two. Uh, Congress, if, co if Congress passes comprehensive legislation which sets up a national cap and trade program. Should New York and other states still have a role? I would argue very strongly, absolutely. Climate change is just too massive a challenge for Washington to solve alone. States like New York must continue to develop programs that move our nation toward a low carbon, clean energy economy. To achieve the necessary mission levels, we'll need action from all levels of government and communities are best positioned to implement smart growth and similar land use policies. In New York, we're facilitating local actions through our Climate Smart Communities Pledge, which now includes 77 communities across the state. Likewise, the states can continue to lead the way in developing policies to promote renewable energy and achieve the promise of energy efficiency. Governor Patterson's 45 by 15 initiative is just one leading example, as is our reinvestment of our Reggie proceeds. Of course, if a national program is created, the focus of New York's efforts and other states will change. It will certainly change depending on how rigorous and robust the national program is. With our budget problems in New York, we'll have to use our limited resources smartly, of course. That may mean continuing to develop the low-carbon fuel standard and other transportation efforts, but leaving the cap and trade to the federal government, but just for the time being. We will also continue to work with a broad group of stakeholders on our climate action plan to achieve the governor's goal of reducing the New York State's greenhouse gas emissions by 80% by the year 2050. Meeting that goal will be a massive task that requires an all-hands-on-deck approach, including dozens of strategies, many of them no-lose strategies for New York and local governments. Even if there's a federal cap on emissions, many of these policies still make sense in New York. They create jobs, they reduce pollution, they decrease energy bills, and most importantly, they help move New York in a direction where it can thrive in a carbon-limited world. They also benefited the nation as a whole. For example, by reducing our use of fossil fuels in New York, we can lower the price of federal allowances. That makes it easier to ratchet down the federal cap if and when we learn that that is inadequate. Our innovative policies also provide a model for the federal government to follow, just as the Reggie Allowance Auction serves as a model for the federal allowance auction and the California Motor Vehicle Emission Standards have been copied by the Obama administration. Most important, state action provides certainty and confidence to entrepreneurs and innovators of the clean energy economy. That even in the unlikely event that there's a new president in January 2013 who isn't as environmentally progressive as President Obama, there will still be policies and programs on the state level to support them. The fact is that effects of climate change aren't going away. They're not partisan, but they are critically important. So whatever happens in Washington, New York and other states must keep moving ball forward for New York and for the nation. This is a pivotal point in our environmental history. It's not unlike something we faced 40 years ago. 40 years ago, I helped put on Earth Day in New York with a group of friends. Uh, we were just one component, but uh, I then marched down Fifth Avenue to Union Square where hundreds of thousands of people took place and calling on the federal government to get off, the, to get off their fannies and start moving. And obviously it had an effect. I did it then for selfish reasons. I was sick and tired of seeing litter along the trails and stuff in the water when I ran along the Hudson River, worrying about uh, dirty air and all of the other concerns. But so did everybody else, and millions of people across this country rose up and said, damn it, we've had enough, get moving. So that obviously, uh, that enormous outpouring obviously had an impact. The government finally woke up and got engaged, and obviously it led to the creation of the federal EPA, the agency that I'm now privileged to head, DEC, uh, similar agencies all across the country, the ultimate passage of the Clean Water Act and the Clean Air Act and a lot of other issues that are now being addressed. And 40 years later, the water is dramatically cleaner, the air healthier, as everybody knows. Thousands of toxic waste sites have been cleaned up. And we, we, we've been better, and we're obviously better for the strong actions that we've taken. 
But just like in 1970, we face another seminal moment in environmental history. This time, the challenge is meeting the dire threat of, to our state, our nation, and our world posed by climate change. The good news is we have a president and an EPA that care about this, and we have an engaged citizens that have driven this same equation. It's hard to imagine that we would be talking about climate change at this level that weren't for those kids seeing those polar bears on those ice flows, talking to their parents, bringing these issues up in school. Again, a bottoms-up movement that finally is driving a discussion in Washington that is long, long overdue. But we're obviously, we're going to have to continue to keep the pressure on Washington. I just can't imagine the difficulty that Senator Kerry is facing, trying to wonder where he's going to get 60 votes for his climate change bill. Um, somebody pred predicted uh, to me uh, last week that he'd be lucky today to find 35 votes. I hope that's not the case, because clearly there's a need to get a bill through the Senate so that they can start working between the House and Senate versions. But obviously, we have hard choices to make uh, here and across the nation. Our answer is that we're making them. We're making them now, and we'll have to continue to make them. And uh, we look forward to be able to continue to do that, whether we have a Democratic president, Republican president, a new governor who is a liberal Democrat, or a new governor who is a conservative Republican. There's nothing partisan about this issue. We have a lot of work to do, and we all need to do it together. Thanks. Thank you, and now I'll invite Pedro Nieves to talk. Good morning. I think that will be hard for me to top off, but I'll, I'll make it right. Anybody from Puerto Rico here? <laughs> Great. Anybody has been to Puerto Rico recently? Okay, well, please remember the good pictures and, you know, <laughs> beaches and all that when I'm talking here. Good morning. First of all, I would like to thank EPA, my partner, um, the ABA and Columbia Law School for the invitation. Uh, for this great opportunity to highlight Puerto Rico environmental issues uh, to a different audience. Uh, I was talking to one of your fellow uh, participants that I haven't been to uh, attorney conferences recently. Uh, maybe it's because of the enforcement issues in Puerto Rico, but that's another matter. I've been banned out apparently, and only engineers want to talk to me. So uh, it's good to be back before lawyers. Uh, before continuing with my speech, uh, I would like to make uh, two quick disclaimers. One that I am an EPA Region 2 Council who is on detail as Chairman of the Puerto Rico Environmental Quality Board. And uh, as does, I must expressly say that my expression do not constitute EPA public policy, so covered. <laughs> 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 Although an attorney, and the fact that I'm deeply honored to be uh, talking before this first class audience today, I will talk to you as a Puerto Rico citizen and resident with first-hand knowledge of uh, Puerto Rico environmental issues and a little bit of a you know, uh, leverage in its environmental policy. Uh, after listening to uh, my fellow uh, commissioners and speakers, uh, I will say at first glance that Puerto Rico does not have any different environmental issue than what the other states in, in, in Region 2 are facing at this time. However, I do have an obligation to put things into perspective. And for that, I will give you a little bit, really, little bit of a background in Puerto Rico. Currently, we're a U.S. territory located in the Greater Antilles area of the Caribbean, just east of Dominican Republic and uh, west of the Virgin Islands. Uh, we enjoy an uncomfortable temperature that ranges between 85 and 95 degrees year-round, except for winter, where we, you know, we have to deal with low 80s. Uh, <laughs> the payback, well, we get, once in a while, we get a hurricane, and uh, last week we got a tremor of 5.8 uh, degrees. Uh, uh, by the way, you were talking about the uh, exercise that the governor is in today. Well, we had that exercise two weeks ago, so it was just before the uh, tremor. Really, uh, it, it proved to be practice, you know, it does pay. I just, uh, okay, it's not bad. Cell phone is working, nothing bad happened. Went back to sleep. Mm -hmm. uh, trade winds influence uh, uh, the island most of the year, making our air monitoring and advisory efforts more interesting. Uh, we do not only need to deal with, you know, um, emissions from companies, but we also have, you know, the Sahara dust storms, which uh, bring haze conditions to Puerto Rico, and once in a while, volcanic ash from the Montserrat uh, neighboring island, a volcano, which is active. Uh, also, we have over 4 million residents. We are only 100 miles by 35, and our top industrial sectors are tourism, 
manufacturing, mainly pharmaceutical companies, which uh, obviously have a, uh, depend on good quality water, and I'll get to that in a bit. Uh, and we manufacture seven of the top ten uh, prescription medicines in the world, so uh, we have a good uh, uh, pharmaceutical sector there, uh, including Cialis and other, I'm not going to brand, name brands here. Uh, we don't have um, also construction and professional services. We don't have no oil or gas or coal, uh, and over 90 percent of our goods are imported, and that presents a serious uh, solid waste issue for Puerto Rico. Uh, I will go by media, basically, as to water, potable water is rapidly ascending to become the top commodity and geopolitical resource in the future. Uh, having we been saying for years that age oil, uh, oil age is coming to an end, well, I think water is going to be uh, one of the uh, top issues and geopolitical issues principally, uh, not only for the state but for the world. So having the only rainforest within the national park system and a tropical weather could make you think that water is not an issue in Puerto Rico. But to put it simple, it's not a matter of quantity, it's a matter of quality. In that regard, we have improved significantly over the past 40 years, <clears throat> and I may add, the Environmental Quality Board is as well celebrating its 40-year birthday. We were, uh, the law that enacted the uh, Environmental Quality Board was enacted a couple of months before EPA have to make that you know, recognition. Uh, I'm required to. <laughs> and uh, currently, more than 50% uh, of our residential construction in the island is done informally, and that really does have a direct impact in the quality of our waters. Uh, what this means is, is that most of that construction is done without proper supervision or permitting uh, efforts. So in that regard, uh, and our topography, which is mountain-wise, uh, really present a challenge in order how to manage those uh, use waters. Uh, uh, mostly, uh, this uh, in type of informal construction consists of septic tanks, but those septic tanks, since they are not being constructed up to code, do represent, uh, you know, they discharge, get to our water bodies, and, you know, uh, we have an immediate impact on our uh, coliform uh, uh, monitoring throughout the island. No, we're sending. Uh, we are monitoring those for the, uh, with, uh, uh, for the main uh, uh, the beach area, so the tourist area, so we issue advisories uh, so that everybody's aware of what's happening. Uh, we have seen and identified uh, problematic areas and we're, you know, the agency along with other agencies are taking steps towards implementing measures to uh, avoid uh, this uh, situation from expanding and having uh, uh, that type of uh, situation repeat. By the way, one of the things, and this I will have to cite with New Jersey, uh, we, uh, we recently, uh, uh, the governor recently signed uh, a new permits law which will transform the permit system in Puerto Rico. One of the environmental benefits that that law will do have is uh, to provide uh, a professional, a licensed professional, which uh, what we understand is will cover these type of facilities and no use permit should be issued uh, without uh, proper inspection of the septic system attached to that residential house. We do regulate, the EQB does regulate uh, commercial and uh, uh, multifamiliar uh, um, septic systems. However, the, the single home septic systems were the issue and still the issue. And, but we do expect to, in 10 years, have a significant improvement uh, for that uh, specific matter. Um, Solid waste, uh, I, I will say that's our biggest challenge for the next 10 years. Uh, right now, uh, our recycling rate is uh, a proud 10% approximately, <laughs> and that is not proud. Uh, we are working with that, and that stems mostly because uh, of our 90%, more than 90% of our goods are imported, so it really does make it difficult to establish packaging requirements and to create a culture uh, in the island that uh, towards uh, recycling. Uh, in addition, the only way that we have to dispose of waste is by landfilling. Right now, uh, we are proximate to start implementing uh, the new public policy, which is a dynamic itinerary, which includes various ways of uh, disposing for waste, and in addition, of increasing the recycling and reducing the, uh, you know, the waste that we generate. In terms of air, air quality issues in Puerto Rico are caused mainly by atmospheric conditions outside our jurisdiction and uh, major emissions from power generator sector. Uh, in that regard, until recently, uh, 
the government was the only power generator, a government, uh, government owned corporation uh, until approximately a decade or a little bit more where uh, we had uh, um, one coal uh, power plant and one uh, uh, natural gas power plant. That has helped in many ways uh, in reducing electricity costs and obviously in improving uh, the air quality because the older power plants are being, uh, uh, are they phased out or, re or being repowered, um, rehauled so that they for more efficient and clean technologies. Um, however, uh, our energy production sector uh, renovation is long due. Uh, in that regard, uh, for the past 60 years, uh, Puerto Rico has had a one-dimensional approach to power generation, fossil fuels. Uh, these currently represent 99% of our energy production. More than 85% of that uh, rests exclusively on oil. For consumers, that represents an electricity rate that is two times the average rate here in the mainland. And environmentally speaking, well, that represents increased air pollution, associated health care costs, and believe it or not, economic competitiveness is affected because of these. And I have to uh, uh, talk later with, my, uh, with Gallagher. Uh, in 2008, <coughs> average retail price in Puerto Rico was uh, 21 cents per kilowatt hour in New York was 16.5, so we are number one on that one, too. <laughs> um, so, uh, obviously, uh, this administ the administration is very uh, committed towards uh, uh, revamping the economy, restarting it in, with the recession in Puerto Rico started uh, a year or two before it started in the mainland. So. Uh, right now, uh, what we are trying to uh, do is revamp it, but at the same time, uh, uh, implementing uh, efficient and doable environmental uh, practices and measures. Uh, the governor does believe, and uh, he's a strong supporter, that economic development does not clash nor is uh, uh, in uh, conflict with uh, environmental protection. So in that sense, uh, some of the things that I've thought, that I've said already, and others uh, will reflect that. Um, in addition to that, uh, recently we, uh, a bill was presented by the administration, which it's, we hope that it's uh, approved uh, this, uh, this term, uh, these uh, two months, next two months, uh, that we adopt a renewable portfolio standard with 12% by 2015 and 15% 15 by 2020 as a minimum target. Uh, we'll also f uh, create a renewable energy commission to monitor compliance and quality only on renewables. Uh, at the same time, it sets a framework for renewable energy certificates, recognizing that those certificates are a valuable asset that incorporates economic, social, and environmental values. Uh, at the same time, I may say uh, that Reggie uh, recently uh, uh, extended us an invitation to, work, uh, to be observers and uh, Puerto Rico will soon uh, issue the letter uh, approving, uh, accepting the offer. So we are proud to be part of Regis as a servers uh, for the time being. Um, one point that has not been expressly discussed by the other two commissioners, uh, environmental emergencies. Uh, when I went in, I'm an attorney, basically. Yeah. So, you know, I was a bit skeptical of emergency. Oh, that seldom happened. We have had, you know, oil spills in Puerto Rico. We have a some issues, fires, but nothing major. Uh, one night, I was, yeah, this is a true story. I was seeing, uh, I got like 10.30 from the office, uh, 10 30, uh, engineering disaster, oh, that's good. And there was this fire of a uh, uh, tank farm. I said, oh, we're never gonna get that. Uh, I have two tire facility fires, so yeah, it, that's not gonna happen. Lo and behold, two hours later, hey, chief, we have a problem. <laughs> Uh, the tank farm in Catania is on fire. So there we have the Capeco fire. Uh, it got a really good coverage uh, throughout the nation, so, uh, and it was a really huge issue. We got lucky. We, we had a good trade winds that uh, basically uh, move uh, the emissions out of the uh, populated areas, and, you know, it was a really good response. So we got lucky with that one. Notwithstanding, uh, what I'm trying to say here is, uh, you know, we got to be prepared. You are seeing the example now with the BP oil spill. And as you said, you fear that it gets to uh, <clears throat> New Jersey. I fear that it gets to Puerto Rico, you know, uh, somehow or the other, some way or the other. So uh, we cannot let those things uh, uh, 
be down on the list, specifically when we are in a tight economic uh, situation or, or recession. Uh, companies are cutting costs in safety measures and prevention, and that, you know, those trainings are worth gold for those companies. So uh, the persons and the uh, government and private uh, attorneys that are here, please stress that to your clients. Do not let down that part because the environmental consequences could be uh, big. Uh, on governance and administrative measures, uh, when I, I initiated my tenure in January 2009, we were faced with the situation that we had more than 13 of the regulations of the agency that had not had a major revision for more than 10 years. And I'm being kind with that number. Uh, in addition, uh, uh, as of now, we expect to have uh, those regulations by the end of this year. So far, we have already revised almost 25 percent of the regulations and issued public uh, uh, notices. So we expect to, uh, and consolidation, so we expect to have that by this year uh, done. In addition, uh, just to make it more interesting, we have had a hiring freeze, retirement windows, layoffs, reduced budget of uh, approximately more than 30 percent. I just uh, received a new one, reduced again. Uh, but then again, uh, we're doing magic. We're doing less with uh, more with less, uh, and the bottom line, you know, is it's of my presentation is you know these three points. Uh, we need to emphasize on knowledge, and that's why we're here. You know, exchanging these thoughts, uh, listening to these great presentations and information and experience by other commissioners. Resources, you know, we need to maximize our resources and, and put them where they they do make a difference. Uh, Many people will say that, and will probably I will I'm echoing them, but uh, you, I have noticed firsthand what's the difference between having a person behind a desk or in the field. Uh, that's where the bottom line gets affected. That's where most of the passion of those employees, it's, it's motivation. Their motivation arises, and, you know, and they don't get loose with paper, and they get that uh, enthusiasm again that we need in order to protect our environment. And third, the will. Will. Um, uh, the political will, if you will say, or the uh, personal will. Um, that's something that we need leaders that are committed to that. And in that regard, I'm, uh, I'm relaxed and, and I feel at ease that we're doing that in Puerto Rico. Our governor is uh, very committed to uh, do, making strong decisions, not thinking about the four-year term. So I hope that through my speech today, you agree that Puerto Rico is heading in the right direction? And if not, well, we'll go back to number one, to knowledge. Uh, we can discuss this and we can, you know, uh, take from your ideas. Uh, we are open for, you know, not only for business, but only for criticism. So uh, <clears throat> we cannot be afraid of discussing our environmental issues openly in order to look for a common solution. <clears throat> Net nature and thus our environment does not know of political boundaries or titles. Case in point, PB's oil spill. Um, <clears throat> We need to uh, replicate this discussion and commit ourselves, so we invite you to Puerto Rico whenever you want to do this there. We'll set it up. <laughs> and as I said earlier on, uh, our environmental issues are no different than the other states. So thank you for your uh, attention. Thank you very much. We have a good deal of time for questions. First question. My question is for Puerto Rico. Is Puerto Rico, um, and I sat down, um, is Puerto Rico looking to invest in more solar PVs, you know, solar on rooftops, parking, parking lots, carports, offshore wind, and also is Puerto Rico looking to close down its landfills to um, create waste energy plants? I'm just looking at the change in energy policy for Puerto Rico. That's easy. Yes, yes, and yes. <laughs> okay, no, no, I'm going to go in a bit more detail. Yes. Uh, we have been uh, working, uh, on, yes, on uh, PVs, solar PVs, uh, not only in installation but also in manufacturing. Uh, however, you know, uh, we need to address other issues, but, yeah, it's moving. We have received IRA funds as well, and uh, we have been, you know, one of the leaders in spending them, so uh, that's good news as well. Uh, we were in the top five for SRF IRA uh, for drinking water. Uh, top five states. Uh, as to uh, waste to energy, yes, uh, EPA uh, has closed five uh, landfills within the past, um, I would say from 2007 on, that, so that leaves us with 29 
landfills at this point, many of them with their uh, life expectancy already expired or close to it. Uh, so yes, we do have a pretty good situation, and wastewater is one of the uh, uh, public policy that, that the government is, uh, is uh, uh, trying to move. However, you know, we understand and we know the permitting process is long, it's complicated, uh, but we're working to make it a reality because we don't have time. Uh, uh, solid waste issue has been ignored for, for a long time in Puerto Rico, and uh, we need to take a stance and, and make the tough decisions that we need to make, and we are doing already, so. Uh, by the way, there are a couple of empty seats in front, so if people want to come in front. Next question. Yes, sir. Uh, Commissioner Granis, um, we're very good um, at point source control. But um, we know that with greenhouse gases, really carbon dioxide is about 43% of the total radiative forcing. So we have nitrous oxide from fertilizer runoff. We have methane from agriculture and from landfills. Do you have some thoughts regarding how New York State or we as a society um, can start to get at these very potent uh, greenhouse gases? You know, the governor's uh, climate action plan that we're working on right now is going to obviously have to address all of these issues because in order to not only meet the aspirational goals of reducing the combination of greenhouse gases by 80 percent by 2050, we're going to have to set out a roadmap on how to get there. So whether it's methane or non-point source, uh, 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 you know, uh, sources of, of greenhouse gas loadings, we're, we're obviously going to have to factor that all in. This is a very, very aggressive plan. The governor set out a, not only a sort of a tight goal on what he wanted, but also a very, very tight time schedule. So the plan is to have the goal, the plan available by the beginning of November. Um, I think that will be followed, uh, preceded by public comment periods, and the, and the goal we're through our technical advisory groups, there are five of them that are moving forward right now. I mean, I think these are going to be, all these issues are going to be addressed. Obviously, methane is a big issue, landfills, we've uh, just put out our solid waste management plan for uh, for a revision, it's a very aspirational goal to get zero waste, which everybody understands is a, you know, is a, is a great goal, but how we get there is, is important. And concern about methane and landfills and this interaction with whether or not we're going to have a more aggressive policy on waste energy uh, facilities. Uh, I was actually struck in the middle of the discussion about the, the management plan itself and its focus on methane and, and uh, landfilling to go on these websites and look at how far the technology has advanced since those horrible days when we were closing down incinerators that were gassing communities and ruining some of the poorer communities in, in our state, uh, one of which was just to the north of the state capitol where you can see the stacks from an incinerator that just put a coat of dust on every car and every backyard, and, and that wasn't that long ago, and that memory, I think, lingers on and sort of uh, is still a, a, an issue that we have to cope with if we're ever going to move to, uh, you know, a technology approach to avoiding landfill. So, but these are all going to be part of the energy plan that the governor, I mean, the, uh, the uh, climate plan that the governor's called for this year. If I may add uh, to the question, because it was a really good question, I, I must say, <clears throat> regarding waste to energy in Puerto Rico. Uh, yes, uh, and, and that's, that's some of the concerns that we have. Uh, however, uh, being, you know, there are no waste to energy in Puerto Rico at this point. Uh, then again, the only option is landfilling or putting in a barge and sending it to mainland or other nation. That's too expensive. It, it simply doesn't make a, a economical sense. Uh, so yes, we are uh, you know learning from the experience of other states, and uh, that's basically what we are using also as a, one of the uh, counterbalances to at the point when we permit those uh, facilities that it, they have the right conditions uh, based on experience from other uh, um, states. My, my question is for Commissioner Granis. You briefly mentioned smart growth in your remarks, and I know that former Governor Spitzer had created a smart growth cabinet a long time ago that we haven't heard very much from, and I'm wondering if whether we can expect anything on that front, whether it's legislation or, or guidance. Yeah. One of the, event, the answer is yes. Uh, one of the advantages of being in the legislature a long time and being lucky enough to have some extraordinarily bright people worked for me when I was in the assembly. Uh, one of them now heads the smart growth, is the staff lead for the smart growth cabinet that the governor called for. 
And uh, there are initiatives, and I think some things will be announced by Paul Beyer, who's the staff leader for that. That issue is coming out of the Department of State. Um, we are obviously a key participant in the smart growth development. Um, but I think the initiatives that came out of the cabinet early on that didn't go anywhere, I think are going to find new life in some of the announcements that uh, Paul Beyer and the governor will be making soon about a, a grant that they received, and they'll be talking about that. So whether or not it's going to have time to factor into the legislative session this year, uh, clearly a uh, difficult window of opportunity given there are all their other difficulties, I don't know. But I think there will be some positive recommendations coming out of the cabinet in the fairly near future. Use the microphone. Uh, for Commissioner Granis, uh, I, I, you mentioned the Carrie Lieberman bill, and there are provisions in the Carrie Lieberman bill that both limit the authority of state governments with respect to uh, climate change action, as well as limiting the authority of EPA, which in turn also limits the authority of state uh, agencies because some portion of DEC's authority, for example, is derived from uh, EPA authority. And so I'm wondering if you could uh, talk about what you and other state environmental commissioners are doing uh, regarding those preemptions. That's a very, very good question. Obviously, the, first and foremost, the Carrie Lieberman bill, I think, through a drafting error, would preempt state cap and trade programs immediately, um, which we were told was some uh, an oversight when they were putting together this huge huge bill but clearly the ability to i mean the the call for preempting state cap and trade programs uh we take we now i'm talking about new york and some of the reggie states take strong exception to uh, they're a little more timid in massachusetts given the lead author of the bill in voicing criticisms of his work but uh we are focusing a lot on that and i was actually pleased to hear that mike had looked at other areas where there was preemption I'm a very strong believer in having, the, whether we use it or not, having the ability of local governments to move ahead. Uh, that also, I think, puts pressure on federal negotiators to come up with a better bill because they don't want it to be undermined. Um, there is a possibility that whatever happens in Washington may not be good enough, big surprise, and that we may need to do more. Um, and it may, you know, change the focus and the energy and, and the commitment may change with the change of administration. So I think preserving the local initiatives, we've been very successful, as I mentioned before, in taking on some of the low-hanging fruit and doing things that have made a difference nationally and, and locally on achieving the short-term greenhouse gas reductions that we, that the president called for, the 17%. Um, but it's, a, it's an ongoing issue. I mean, clearly the ideal thing is to have a very robust federal program that would obviate the need for a local program. I don't think in New York and any of the Reggie states we're looking for parallel programs. Um, the Markey Waxman bill obviously had a blackout window, which I think is appropriate to see whether or not a federal program could work and how it would work. But it was a relatively short term, six or seven years. Um, but I am worried. I mean, I did many bills when I was in the legislature, and I know what it takes to round up votes and to get 60 votes in the U.S. Senate. I just worry that there may have been too many uh, compromises made in the draft, and luckily it would have to go to a House Senate conference committee if it ever got uh, past the Senate, and then maybe they could work out some of those issues. But clearly preemption is something I've always uh, resisted and opposed. I opposed it when I was a state legislator and now as a regulator. I think it was, it's a big mistake to cut off, particularly in this program where the model being used is the very model that they're seeking to preempt. I think that's a little disingenuous most charitable way to put it. Uh, David? <laughs> this question is for Commissioner Granis. Um, as you know, Commissioner, there's been a, a long-running um, controversy in the state about the Brownfield program and the way it's been administered by the agency. Uh, on the one hand, uh, Brownfields is, a, is an economic uh, and uh, sustainability and a uh, environmental justice issue. On the other hand, obviously, uh, the tax credits that are implied by the Brownfield program are uh, uh, pretty generous uh, in a period of economic stress uh, and budgetary deficits. And of course, we have the 
a recent uh, Lighthouse Point case, which uh, may require DEC to take a little bit different approach to administering the Brownfield program. I was wondering, in light of these uh, conflicting goals, uh, what the DEC's program is on a going forward basis in terms of stimulating Brownfield redevelopment. Well, I'll do it in two parts. I think one of the programs that worked well until we got to the tax credit version in 2002 or 2003 was the voluntary program. And I think the ability for a developer to find certainty and quick responses and finding out whether or not a site is eligible and whether or not it can be uh, cleaned up quickly to our standards without waiting for the tax credit program to kick in, I think would be a, a big addition to our uh, uh, set of tools that we use on brownfield cleanups. The program has never worked as we envisioned it when we passed it in 2002, uh, making it an as-of-right tax credit program. Uh, there's 17 projects that are out there by 12 developers that uh, stand to consume a billion dollars worth of tax credits for developing sites. And People probably know if you're following the Lighthouse Point case, uh, some of those are in New York and the hottest real estate markets in the world where sites have been cleaned up uh, out of necessity to get the bedrock to put in foundations uh, regardless of what was on the site and those might be eligible. So we're looking to reform the tax credit aspect of the program. At the end of the day, my responsibility is making sure these sites are cleaned up properly. Um, the tax credit issue is, I care as a taxpayer, but it's not really our issue so that if the the decision of the uh, Court of Appeals in the Lighthouse Point case uh, holds and we don't have to worry about everybody's in the program, that'll save us some time. Um, obviously, we're still having you know, arguments about the cleanup standards that we have in place, um, but we're looking to try to find some rational way to use limited state resources more constructively to focus on projects that uh, are wanted and needed in a community that have been, are in designated areas that have been pre-cleared and pre-designated by communities, which is a pilot program we're using in Buffalo. Um, there's a lot of, I think there's a lot of need for reform. What we're finding difficult is to find people to come to the table to talk about those reforms. Meanwhile, they stand to bankrupt the state. So if uh, the program does uh, and its current f formulation, so we're looking to try to rationalize the, the, the program a little bit. But again, you know, we are finding if there are ways that we can expedite, we know it's a tedious process to go through the paperwork and this is where some of the discussion here, you know, if we can find ways to make the program more, uh, you know, efficient as, as we move ahead, we're looking for that and we're, I think we're talking about sort of realignment of some of the resources within the department to take account of the fact that we are losing hundreds of people uh, through uh, hiring freezes, through early retirement, through uh, regular retirements. Uh, um, I think we're going to be down 800 to 900 people from our peak uh, by the end of the fiscal year. So we obviously have to find ways to do things uh, more effectively and efficiently using the resources that we have. Yes. My question is for Commissioner Granis. Um, just wondering if the DEC is willing to consider a moratorium on permitting and drilling until after the EPA findings on hydrofracturing are reported and what is the DEC prepared to do if the EPA analysis eclipses that of the EIS? Let me turn it around. Are you prepared to accept whatever EPA concludes without any further question? Because that's th this argument that somehow EPA, which is now starting a review, which we've been undertaking for two years, to look at you know, virtually every aspect of hydraulic fracturing, uh, the experience in every other jurisdiction, the science, the uh, the, uh, the geology, everything that goes on, EPA is just starting that process. Uh, I think we are not expecting them to find anything different, but would you be prepared to live with their result no matter what it is? Well, I think they're looking at it from a few they're talking additional about, aspects They're, they're, they're the talking about is. looking at it. They haven't started. No, they have. So the bottom line, we're not, uh, you know, the, this issue has come up time and time again. Throw out the EIS, it's fatally flawed. It was a great phrase because it was used by every Republican Congress member when he voted for the Health Care Act. Fatally flawed, but uh, we don't believe it's fatally flawed. It's a draft. It's out for public comment. Or it's done. It's, it's undergoing review. We think we, uh, with the uh, information that we now have in hand, are prepared to come up with a final uh, supplement to the GEIS as Stu talked about this morning. Um, there's no basis whatsoever that we have for a moratorium. Uh, in any event, and so I think we're prepared to move ahead uh, 
with our mandate, which is to make sure that this legal activity is undertaken in a way that's safe and environmentally responsible. So I have a question that I'm going to put to both Mr. Cantor and Commissioner Granis, and it's about the future of nuclear power in your respective states. Do you anticipate that in the next few years um, the, uh, any of the nuclear power plants that are now operating will shut down, and do you anticipate that in the next few years any of them will expand their capacity? Yes and yes. Um, you know, we have New, um, New Jersey ha gets about 50 percent of its um, electrical power through our three nuclear power plants right now. Oyster Creek, which I mentioned before, um, is the oldest nuclear power plant in the, in the nation. And it's been just recently relicensed by NRC for an additional 20 years. Um, it, we just issued a permit for it, uh, an Egyptese permit. Uh, and require it to put on cooling towers um, as opposed to taking uh, intake from, from the Barnegat Bay, which we think has a, a significant environmental impact. Um, you know, Exelon, who owns Oyster Creek, has said if we proceed with uh, the requirement to put on the cooling towers, that they will close down the plant. So in any event, that plant will probably uh, be closed in 20 years at the outset, uh, maybe earlier if we proceed with the um, – you know, requirement for cooling towers. Uh, PSENG, who is our largest power, um, you know, facility or, or company in New Jersey, operates th three nuclear power plants down in the southern part of our state, and they are just now beginning to begin that process to discuss putting in a fourth nuclear power plant in, in, in the state. So if Oyster Creek closes down, um, it, you know, it's not unforeseeable that another power plant may be um, built in, in New Jersey. But again, you know, we're at the early stages that conversation. Uh, we joined with the Attorney General in challenging the relicensing of Indian Point 2 or 3, which was it, Joe? 3. three. Um, because of our concern over ongoing safety and, uh, I guess, reliability problems at that plant, and uh, this is a, a challenge that we have pursued. We also have just recently denied a permit application for the water certification, the 401 certification for their for the uh, Indian Point plant for the very same reasons that uh, Ray, just talk, Ray just talked about, about uh, the need for uh, putting in cooling towers to protect the incredibly important uh, natural resource of the fish and all of the wildlife that gets sucked through this once, once through cooling system. Interestingly enough, when I first worked at DEC 40 years ago, this was an issue. Um, and we took on using very much more sort of rudimentary laws where we challenged uh, then Con Edison's use of the once through cooling system through an old provision in the law that says you can't impound water and then drain it to catch fish. And it was an impoundment law. And when their lawyers showed up in, in Albany and we were talking about 10 bucks a fish, they <laughs> that's when they went to uh, the governor. And we uh, had a slightly, slightly different direction at that point. But this has been an ongoing issue. <laughs> ongoing issue for this plant, whether they put in cooling towers. I mean, they're expensive and they're going to be complicated to put in, but this will be a business decision if our permit uh, denial holds and they have to make a business decision whether to put in the cooling towers or to shut the plant down. Uh, I think that's going to be an ongoing discussion. We're at the very early stages and obviously they have taken issue with our denial, so we Do expect uh, challenges along the way. Do you anticipate any expansions in the upstate nuclear power plants? You know, that's a good question, and I can't remember. I mean, I, I worked on the on the energy plan, state energy plan, and I can't remember what their conclusion is. But working for the governor, I'm somewhat bound by their conclusion, whatever it was. <laughs> Back, yes. We've heard various uh, greenhouse gas reduction strategies this morning. We've heard federal carbon. Uh, cap and trade. We haven't heard carbon tax. We've heard about REGI. Another instrumentality is through a feed-in tariff. Um, it's been very successful in Germany. I understand this right across the border in Ontario. What are each of your jurisdictions positions on a feed-in tariff at this time? Let me just give what, for anybody who doesn't know what a feed-in tariff it is, is, it is basically a guaranteed price for renewable energy. In, in, in I don't know. I don't know what that. Sorry, it's just. I know you know we're not going to pursue a, a state-only carbon tax. 
I just don't see that in the picture, and I don't even see any, I think, meaningful discussion in Washington of a carbon tax because of the level that it would have to be in order to, to affect uh, um, uh, use of carbon fuels. I just don't see that being the future. And you sit through one of these talks with Arnold Schwarzenegger sort of as an amusing discussion of this because as talking about changing human behavior and whether or not people are going to use less fuel for heating their, their saunas and uh, whirlpools and driving their Hummers, he said, and flying their private jets. Um, he is basically talking about a technology uh, approach as opposed to a carbon tax that's going to change the price of fuels sufficiently to adjust outcomes. But, you know, clearly a national cap and trade program, I guess the carbon price on uh, anticipated with the uh, um, Kerry Lieberman bill was like, I can't remember, it's $18 a ton? It's, yeah, it's in that range. It'd be yeah, 12 $18 to, a ton. People yeah. keep thinking that's not going to be sufficient unless it ratchets up. Our carbon price for our Reggie allowances is uh, like $250 a, dollar, 250 a ton. Clearly not uh, going to affect uh, the use of uh, fossil fuels. But the feed-in tariff, I just don't know. I, I don't know that, that issue. All right, if that proposal, again, I'm, I'm not familiar, it is a guaranteed price or a, a set price for renewable energy, you know, um, is that essentially what, what it does? It's my understanding that a feed-in tariff provides parity for renewable energy versus fossil fuels and that, it, yes, it provides a set price for producers of renewable energy for a, I believe, several decades of time so that they can then make the investment and know that they're going to get a, a return on that investment. I can't speak specifically about that, you know, process. I, I do know, again, that New Jersey is trying to be, uh, if nothing else, the, the national leader in offshore wind, and we are in negotiations with a number of companies who want to put, um, you know, large fields, you know, all, off our coast, you know, to have wind energy. Part of those discussions we're going with right now is to provide them a guaranteed you know, rate uh, of, that they could charge utilities to, to buy their, um, uh, the energy. You know, where we are or where we end up in those negotiations, you know, it, it, we're still at the beginning, but the, the companies who have approached us are saying that they need exactly that type of guarantee to make that type of investment. So, you know, we're, we're aware of it, but we haven't made those final determinations yet. Let me just say the focus in New York uh, has been more on the renewable portfolio standard, which is not the same as the feed-in tariff, but has some of the same uh, impacts. Yes. Tengo una pregunta para el señor Nieves, but I'll switch to English for everybody else. <laughs> um, I, I noticed that um, you didn't mention that um, in your remarks that Puerto Rico has uh, one of the highest, if not the highest, per capita ownership of cars in, in the world. And I was wondering um, if the island is uh, examining how to address all the impacts that that represents. Okay, so I'm going to answer that in Spanish. <laughs> um, no, actually, um, well, here's the thing. Uh, it is a cultural thing. Let's start with that. Uh, were you raised in Puerto Rico? Okay, well, well, everybody at 16 years wants to have a car, a girlfriend, and money. So, you know, uh, uh, so the thing is, you know, uh, it's, we are working, uh, you know, with a low carbon fuel standard. However, uh, what we've seen, it's, it's really difficult. You know, um, uh, there's only one refinery uh, in St. Croix. That's the one that provides fuel to uh, basically all the Virgin Islands. So uh, getting them to do that, it's going to be extremely difficult and it's going to cost money. And with a re you know, economy in recession, uh, it's, it's too difficult for Puerto Ricans to deal with that. We already have to deal with a fuel source surcharge um, in our electricity bills and believe me it's 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 not it's not pretty when you see your bill you know sixty dollars and then you see a hundred and fifty for the surcharge you know it's 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 not good um, so uh, in that regard we we are you know uh, implementing more uh, efficient inspection measures for uh, greenhouse gases in cars etc and we should be unveiling those uh, within the next six months uh, so that, you know, we can implement, develop and implement other uh, public policy decisions as to how we're going to do with, deal with uh, mobile sources. Oh, yes, we're dealing with some. 
sorry. We are retrofitting uh, buses and uh, ferries. Uh, in addition, uh, we are implementing, uh, um, let me see, for the translation, sorry guys. <laughs> Uh, there are certain areas where we have uh, uh, anti-idling uh, uh, regulations that we, we do not have at this point, so uh, we are uh, also working on those and we should expect those in, I would say, uh, a year or closer. So yes, we're working on numerous projects. Uh, we, we, we know that we have a deal of work uh, ahead of us, uh, but you know we are little by little uh, heading into the right direction and trying to uh, you know, uh, get there. Thank you. Uh, this question is for Mr. Cantor. Uh, I believe in passing you mentioned self-certification. I was curious if you could elaborate on what sort of areas you think are and aren't appropriate for that, and if where you do allow self-certification, if there be audits uh, of the certifiers to ensure compliance. Well, uh, absolutely. Um, what we have right now, again, is our licensed cyber remediation professional program, which only deals with, you know, brownfields contaminated sites. And we're very much in, in the process of beginning to implement that. We have about 300 or some odd uh, professionals who are now licensed. We have a, a licensing board, which will be overseeing them. And we have you know, a really robust, you know, auditing program to make sure that, you know, what they're submitting to us, you know, it, it is accurate and that they're, they're adhering to our environmental standards. Uh, th th there may be a number of other areas where this type of program you know, um, can be used. I think Puerto Rico just mentioned you do that for your, um, for your septic tanks, uh, that type of certification program. There may be a number of areas, either, either in the land use, possibly air programs, where it may be appropriate, but we're not going to take that next step until we see the success of this, this program. It's been very controversial. You know, the environmental community has obviously um, has concerns and in a sense turning over you know the hen house to, to the foxes but we have again 20,000 sites that aren't being cleaned up and we don't have the staff you know we've had staff cutbacks over the last decade as well so we can't clean up these sites you know given our existing resources we need to look for, for different methodologies so if this program proves successful we will then look to see what other areas it, it can be expanded to but I don't want to speculate what they are right now but but we are looking for its success to be a model you know, for other programs. If, if you allow me, he mentioned Puerto Rico, so I have to respond. Mm -hmm. um, here's the thing. Uh, uh, what we've seen in Puerto Rico basically is, you know, people do the informal construction. They have a friend in the power company. They go connect the power. They get the use permit. That's it. Uh, so it, the construction never gets impacted. Never, you know, you don't know if a septic tank, which is attached to many of those construction, it's, uh, we never know that it's there until you know somebody goes and uh, empties it if they empty it properly um, <clears throat> so uh, with this new law and the regulation that just went out uh, last week uh, what we expect is the it will be easier for the persons to go instead of a governmental agency to go through a licensed professional which is engineers which have to take some courses etc so it will, it will be easier for them to go through that professional, and that professional will inspect and issue the, uh, uh, what will, will prepare the application, an additional one will inspect, and you know, a uh, use permit will be issued. So we expect that with that, we are going to receive the result that we want. We're going to have those uh, uh, structures with appropriate use permits. At the same time, the law created an office of the inspector general specifically for permits. And it's required by law to uh, inspect a percent of the permits issued by those professionals. And the penalty, it's, uh, it's not an administrative penalty, it's uh, you know, uh, uh, revoking the license and a uh, criminal penalty in case that it has uh, an impact on human health or the environment. It's now 1 o'clock. There are box lunches on the table outside together with beverages. Uh, and there are also a lot of little tables around where you can eat or you can bring it back in here. We will resume at 1.45 for the talk by Judith.